We're flying 500 feet in the mountains without night vision goggles. It is pitch black. The pilots were taught, as soon as we engaged the train following, to let go of the stick. Tell us about the early days of the B-1. It was not well thought of. The engineers were looking, go, where'd you get that crack from? Incredibly complicated airplane. It had 10,000 maintenance codes. Now you both flew the B-1 together on the nuclear mission. This sat nuclear alert. To get us off the ground, we could launch within five minutes. One of the easiest airplanes to air refuel. High resolution map, we could paint fence posts. It is the ultimate long range strike aircraft. Hi, I'm Stu Bailey, the curator here at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. We are going to talk about a supersonic variable sweep wing heavy bomber, the B-1 Lancer. And to make it even better, on this episode we are going to talk with a pair of B-1 crew members who flew together and share their stories. And this one is going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. In ancient mythology, one of the enduring stories is that of the phoenix, a legendary bird that rises from the ashes of its previous incarnation. If any aircraft embodies this story, it's the Rockwell B-1 Lancer. Cancelled in 1977 after only four aircraft were built, the B-1 was brought back to life in 1981. In this form, 100 additional B-1Bs were built. Originally designed in the 1970s, the B-1 was created to meet the Air Force's needs for a long-range supersonic bomber that could replace both the FB-111A Aardvark and the B-52 Stratofortress as part of the nuclear triad. While the other two legs of the triad, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, and Ballistic Missile Submarines relied on missiles, the manned B-1 bombers could be recalled once launched, offering a unique strategic advantage. Deliveries of the B-1B began in 1985, and by 1988, it was operational as a strictly nuclear-armed bomber. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the B-1B's nuclear capabilities were removed, and it was repurposed as a conventional bomber, leaving the nuclear mission to the B-52, the very aircraft it was originally meant to replace. The B-1 is scheduled to be replaced by the new B-21 Raider, with full retirement planned by 2038. Until then, the bone remains a vital part of America's global strike capabilities, projecting air power around the world at supersonic speeds. Now that we've learned a little bit about the history of the aircraft, let's get started. Garrett Sack Herensack and Tony Voodoo Garrett. Thanks for joining us today. Sack, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started flying the B-1? Well, I'm uh, Major General Retired uh, Garrett Sack Harrensack. I spent the majority of my flying career in the B-1. I started out as a, a B-52 pilot, uh, then was, uh, as we all were at the time, competitively selected to join the B-1 program. A couple thousand hours of flying time with it. I was a aircraft commander then uh, instructor pilot, evaluator pilot, then I was the vice wing commander, and then wing commander of the 7th Bomb Wing, which is uh, one of the two wings uh, that continue to fly as the uh, B-1B. Voodoo, how about you? Lieutenant Colonel retired Tony Voodoo Errett came to the B-1 uh, shortly after a small stint in the B-52s as an electronic warfare officer. Spent majority of my entire flying career in the B-1s. Went from instructor to evaluator as well as top gun from the Navy side of the house. Did numerous uh, testing as weapons evaluations and did combat missions right after 9-11. But for those who aren't familiar with the B-1, how would you introduce this massive aircraft? It's one of the coolest, sexiest aircraft ever built. Certainly uh, one of the most fun planes to fly for its size, incredible uh, weapon system that has been one of the most consequential weapon systems of the last 20 or 30 years for the United States Air Force and the United States military. It is a intercontinental uh, range four-person bomber, long-range strike. It was originally built as a nuclear delivery platform to get through the Soviet airspace at a low altitude to deliver nuclear weapons. It transformed into one of the most accurate and effective conventional uh, warplanes that we've had. It's supersonic at uh, high altitude, low level, 200, 300, 400 feet on the deck with terrain following radars, and it could fly at about 980 feet per second, which is faster than a 45 bullet. A very fast airplane, very low. Voodoo, from your position in the back seat, how did you see the B-1 mature over the years? The B-1, as we matured in the system, moving away from the nuclear capability into the conventional realm, I think blossomed this aircraft into such a strategic platform. The fact that we had uh, 
two ISOs in the back, the, the way we could uh, hand off the capabilities of the, of the various weapon systems. The technology was great as we started going into smart precision weapons at 200 feet with the high resolution radar, it was just phenomenal from. What I saw back in the B-52 days with the radar, blobology is what we used to call it. I um, mean, and, and then when we did the high resolution map, uh, we could paint fence posts, whether we were at 200 feet or we were at 25,000 feet. Very accurate to confirm that, take those coordinates off the radar and actually feed that into the weapon system and drop it. So very good straight capability. After 9-11, when we went into Afghanistan with the JDAMs, just we were a precision capable bomber. And if you look at historically now from all the missions from Desert Fox on this point, the aircraft that brings the most payload to the fight has been the B-1. We're talking uh, three bomb bays that could mix and match. It is the ultimate long-range strike aircraft. One of the easiest airplanes to air refuel. Most pilots will have gotten years without what's called an inadvertent disconnect. There's a lot of other planes. I flew the B-2. Very difficult airplane to air refuel. It takes a lot of experience uh, to refuel that airplane for various reasons. This airplane, yes, it had intercontinental range, but with the amount of 75,000 pounds of weapons it could carry, it really was and is a incredible airplane. Tell us about the early days of the B-1. Were there any challenges? Early on in the B-1, it was not well thought of. History-wise, uh, the B-1A, which four were ever built, it was canceled by President Carter, brought back by President Reagan, resurrected as a B-1B. It was kind of rushed into production. 100 were built uh, very quickly. It wasn't allowed to be uh, tested as well as it did, so it had some maturation problems. Every airplane in this building had maturation problems, I guarantee it. The B-1s though, for a lot of reasons, it was over magnified. Once we transitioned from it no longer needing to be a low level nuclear penetrating bomber to a conventional bomb truck as it is, lots of uh, men and women gave their lives to make sure that it would progress to, uh, uh, to the weapon system that it is today. When the B-1 came out, I mean, one of the biggest thing was the mi middle two bomb bays, the bulkhead could shift. We had all rotary launchers in all three bomb bays, but we could carry a longer one, the common rotary launcher, which was a lot of low cruise missiles. And we had hard points on the outside, just like fighter aircraft did. That capability with its nuclear capability and cruise missiles was a huge reason the Soviet Union, the START Treaty actually came about, was they did not have a capability for us to come in at 200 feet and non-detectable. We could fly with a fuel tank in a certain bay to give us different ranges if we didn't have to refuel as often. We all carried conventional weapons, but the fact that we can carry them internally, the range that we had, so as we went into a strike capability, especially for going into Afghanistan, we became a great weapon for close air support. Having the fact that you had a defensive officer or as well as an offensive officer working together, both trained in the same seats, can be compatible back and forth. We had great communication, the ability to talk with ground crews all at the same time. Four-man crew working together as well as they did was a sight to see, especially when you consider early on when we were flying night low levels and terrain following radar. First of all, let me say that terrain following radar was amazing. All of us had incredible confidence in the terrain following radar. So we're flying 500 feet in the mountains without night vision goggles, it was pitch black, you're flying along at altitude. The Wizzos would engage the terrain following radar. We do all of our checks. The B-1 had three levels of terrain following, soft, medium, and hard. And basically that's how hard the aircraft would level itself off. As a backseater, it was kind of comical. The pilots were taught, as soon as we engage the terrain following, to let go of the stick. And then we would sit in the back and just say, R2 has the jet now. The droid has the jet and we'll just level off. We had tremendous confidence in, in that system. And then to drop the weapon at such a low altitude and at the speed you're flying, it was a rush. It was a, an incredible fun thing to be doing. Another interesting fact in B-1 is our tail section. So when we're flying low level, high altitude with the wing sped at supersonic speed, as the pilots initiate a turn, the tail actually splits. The B-1's unique because the tail is so large and that wingspan, each one of those sections is the same size of an F-15 wing. Predominantly, most standard aircraft have a 3,000 PSI system. The B-1 has a 4,000 PSI system to maneuver and control the hydraulics of that tail section. We fly the same pattern as a fighter does. For a large aircraft, unbelievable. Let's talk more about those low-level missions. The 
great Rockwell engineers uh, put a system called SMUX, Structural Mode Control System. Those veins would be moving at an incredibly high rate. Many people believe that really SMUX was just there to smooth out the ride. Now the engineers realized that it would smooth out the ride, but the real reason you had SMUX was to prevent stress on the airplane. We would sometimes fly with the SMUX not operating at low level just to get the mission done. The engineers were looking, go, where'd you get that crack from? And then uh, they found, well, the SMUX is supposed to prevent that. Oh, well, the SMUX hasn't been working on that airplane for the last six months. And they, oh, OK, you can't fly low level without the SMUX on. So what can you tell us about the variable sweep wings? The variable wings, 15 degrees to 67 and a half. Obviously, if you're going to fly high subsonic speeds, low level, if you're going to go supersonic high level, you're back at 67 and a half. Certainly in a pattern uh, flying, uh, you you'd, push the wings forward. And a lot of other planes that had variable wings, you had to worry about your uh, center of gravity moving. This airplane had a, uh, a very good system where it would automatically do that. So lots of really cool, innovative things that made this plane complicated and sometimes hard to maintain, but incredibly versatile and made it one of the greatest uh, long-range strike aircraft ever made. Voodoo, you had a lot of computers in the back seat there. Uh, can you tell us about the CITS, the, the Central Integrated Test System computers? We used to always joke from the back seat. We had seven computers. We had more than the space shuttle did. Although they were all 128K computers and two 256K computers. But one thing that was integral that kind of got left over from the Rockwell testing that the DOD decided to incorporate was the central integrated test system, which in the SITS computers, we had lines that we could read and was in near English messages that we could tell us the status of our aircraft, whether our landing gear was down, if we had a problem with the wings, as well as when we integrated more and more weapon systems on it, it allowed us to really troubleshoot and, and make sure why things weren't working the way they were supposed to go. It would monitor every system and it had 10,000 maintenance codes. So incredibly complicated airplane, but it had the abilities to monitor that. At the time, it was incredibly advanced. What was it like using the defensive systems on a mission? The defensive system on the B-1 is the ALQ-161, which is a derivative of the EA-6B's ALQ-99. Very, very great electronic warfare suite. However, in the EA-6B, you had three electronic counter officers running the system. The B-1 was designed to be a single individual running the system. Now you both flew the B-1 together on the nuclear mission. How did the crew dynamics for that work? Early days, this sat nuclear alert. Alert was seven days uh, at an alert facility. And the whole idea is you would be 24 seven ready to respond quickly, get to the aircraft, launch within minutes and go toward your nuclear mission. To get us off the ground, we could launch within five minutes of a seven when we start. So we had this unique system. When we get on alert, we'd configure the aircraft, what we called cocking the aircraft on to a point where a single button, we'd hit this APU start button, the ladder would drop, the APUs would start up, the engines would start to spool as the crew ran up in the camera, and we were already for takeoff configuration. We've had a alert crew where we've, and I was on it, we've hit the APU start button, the plane starts up, and the ladder doesn't come down. So the, the jet's ready to go, but we can't get into it. There is a speed crank, 180 hand cranks, to get the ladder back down to get the crew in. I just have to say that does affect our timing, but it was unique to the B-1 how fast we could get off the ground with our weapons. Back in the Strategic Air Command days, why we sat nuclear alert, we got tested all the time, and 100% was the men's score. If the question is, are you going to strike, and the answer was no, and you said yes, and you opened up your ticket, you failed. And then the crew was decertified, I mean, and it, it had repercussions all the way up the ranks. They didn't test you like, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning when you first got up and you had a cup of coffee. You'd been out generating aircraft, you'd been up for 36 hours trying to get an aircraft on alert, and then they would test you. First President Bush took everybody off of alert in the early 90s. So once you were no longer sitting alert, the big advantage of having a dedicated crew where they lived together and they worked together and, and they only flew together um, kind of went away. Now we We've got the a B-1A model here at Wings Over the Rockies, and you flew the B-1B. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences between the A and B models? It's interesting because the A model had a capsule, which is like the 111. There the whole capsule comes out. 
It was a conscious decision to move from the A to the B model to, to move away from the capsule, simply because it was easier to maintain the ACES seats than, than the capsule, the weight. We went from Mach 2.0 to Mach 1 with our variable inlets to make our radar cross-section. The A model didn't have a boron spine on it. The B models ended up with a big boron spine that was put back the top of the aircraft because we basically went up almost 120,000 pound gross weight to increase more weapon capability. The engines were an improvement. It was an F-101 GE-102 afterburning turbofan 30,000 thrust class engines. When the afterburners are on, specifically at takeoff, what you see is a blue flame coming out. In fact, we used to call it blue thunder. And when the blue thunder happened, I'll tell you, you felt it in your bones. These engines are so powerful, created so much vibration that we don't allow car alarms to be set uh, at, at our bases because uh, on a takeoff, of just the vibrations will set car alarms off everywhere. <laughs> they were phenomenal engines. However, due to some decisions made uh, in, in cost savings, the number three generator was taken out. If you talk to the Rockwell engineers, their question is, why would you take out the number three generator? That was the anti-ice generator. It caused a, a little bit of an issue with icing. So you put these airplanes at Grand Forks, uh, North Dakota. You put them at uh, Ellsworth, South Dakota, Wichita, Kansas, and McConnell Air Force Base, and then Dias, all of which are susceptible to cold weathers. You also had the problem of uh, because it was engineered as a, a low-level penetrating bomber, you couldn't go very high. Now we've done a lot of talking about low-level flying missions. What was the highest you guys have ever taken the B-1? I made it to 31,000 feet and then we fell out of the sky. Northern Afghanistan through the border, you could, we could see Mount Everest from the windscreen and going, you know we can't clear that mountain. <laughs> I think the highest I ever went was 32,000 and I was there for minutes. And we had to be in full AB just to stay up there. While they were great engines, you couldn't go high altitude with them. And the heavier you were, the, the, the lower you had to stay. With the B-1 flying for over 50 years and new sixth generation aircraft like the B-21 Raider coming on board. What do you think the final legacy of the B-1B will be when it's retired? Of the hundred built, there's only a few dozen left. The history of the B-1 is going to be that it was the most consequential long-range strike aircraft that America has ever built because of what it was able to accomplish uh, over the last 25 years in combat. I, I know Voodoo and I would consider ourselves incredibly lucky and blessed to have the experiences that we did flying to B-1. But when we get together now over, over beers, we can't drink as many beers as we used to, but when we do, it's looking back on a lifetime of camaraderie and, and adventure. Well, Garrett, Sack, Heron Sack, and Tony, Voodoo, Eric, thanks for being with us today. We couldn't get to everything, so please leave your questions and comments under the video and we'll get to as many as we can. Come to Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum and see the B-1 Lancer, as well as all of our other cool air and spacecraft. We've come to the end of the video, so if you're a subscriber, we want to say thank you very much. And if you're not, well, just subscribe already. Now I gotta get back to work.